Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it is 1.45, so I don't want to hold people up if, you know, we need to be on time. I do want to point out that up here on this table, I have a couple of handouts. So there is a copy of the PowerPoint and my business card and also a handout on the myths and the facts surrounding Social Security benefits. So please feel free to get those at any point um, during this presentation. Today, we want to talk about um, facts versus myths about benefits. And I appreciate all of you being here today to talk about this, because it's a very important topic, especially if you're the person who has the benefit or if you're helping people that have benefits. So it's really important. Uh, my name is Lisa Brown, and I work for NICE. So we're a unit within the Office of Mental Health. Um, and our focus is really providing resources, employment-type resources for people. And we work collaboratively with a lot of agencies to provide those resources. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I am going to try and leave some time at the end of the presentation to um, answer some questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to talk about those at the end of the training. So let me see if I can get this to work correctly. Ta da! Okay. Um, so these are the topics that we're going to cover today. We're going to take a look at New York Employment Services System, and that's where I work. That's the information that we have to share today. Uh, we want to talk about the employment facts and myths in general related to Social Security, but also just, you know, general information. We're going to talk about why working is a good idea in working and maintaining your health care. So there are provisions available to be able to maintain both Medicaid and Medicare benefits. So we want to make sure we talk about that. We also want to talk about Social Security, SSI, and SSDI benefits and the work incentives that are associated with each of those. Um, we fo will follow up with the ABLE accounts and the PASS plans. So we'll be busy today. There's a lot of things to cover. Um, I do want to mention that this is a general overview of this information. So one of the things that's really important to know is that if you are on benefits of any type, Social Security or public benefits, that you get connected with a benefits advisor who can actually work with you on your specific situation um, to give you the knowledge that you need in order to make an informed decision about going to work. So I want to just uh, point that out. Okay, so our first topic is NICE. That's, again, the New York Employment Services System. All of the um, state agencies on this slide work collaboratively with NICE to help provide resources for people with disabilities and resources for people who are going to work. So we work with the Department of Labor, the Office for the Aging, Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, the Office of Mental Health, Department of Health, Commission for the Blind, and Access VR, and Office for Addiction Services and Supports. Um, so throughout all of these resources, we work collaboratively together to help people go to work. So NICE, and it's pronounced NICE, N-I-C-E, um, but we are a statewide partnership and a resource for all things related to employment. We are a collaborative employment services case management system, and we are one of the largest ticket to work administrative employment networks in New York. We are a primary employment services data source as well. We collect data on people who are going to work. This next topic is about why going to work is a good idea. So individuals who have Social Security benefits or other public benefits often feel like they don't want to go to work because they're going to lose some of their benefits. So that's one of the conversations we're going to have today. So why do we need to go to work? So employment is a good idea for all of us. Um, and one of the things that comes up in a lot of research is that it's a social determinant of health. So there are a lot of impacts to our lives, but when we go to work, these things are improved. So not only do we have a better financial picture, uh, but we also have better physical health, typically. Our mental health, socialization, it gives us something meaningful to do throughout the day. 
Um, it can improve our self-worth and our work ethics, and also then overall just an improved quality of life. So we can look at all of those areas as increased benefits to going to work. In addition, sometimes it reduces the need for interventions. So sometimes you can get the supports at work that you would otherwise need to be successful, to have a successful working outcome. So some of those natural supports can be built in to the employment situation so that you may reduce the need for an intervention. Okay, so what do you need to know? So while working while receiving public benefits is a good idea. You don't have to be a benefits expert, but you should understand a couple of basic, infor, uh, basic details about this information. So basically, you will have more money in your pocket, and you won't be penalized for going to work, but you are going to be required to report your income on a monthly basis to Social Security, so they can keep on top of that. Um, you also will be eligible for free Medicaid in almost all scenarios, and we'll talk about that scenario in a little bit. The common anxiety and frustrations associated with public benefits are real, and they should be a part of that employment conversation. So every social service agency has different eligibility requirements for their programs, and keeping it all straight is hard sometimes. You know, it's very frustrating for people. So if we bring up those topics in the employment conversation, it can get that word out. You can talk about it. You can get more information. Um, and then also there are many common myths about what happens when someone on public benefits earns wages that are not real, and we need to include these in the employment conversation. So that's part of what we're going to talk about today, the myths, the facts and the myths about public benefits and going to work. So one of the things that I like to stress is that, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be a basic overview. So for your individual situation, it's very different from the person next to you. And so it's really important for you to connect with someone called a benefits advisor. And a benefits advisor is a person who can give you a, an exact rundown of your specific situation and tell you how your benefits will be impacted by going to work. So if you receive any public benefit type at all, it doesn't just have to be Social Security, it can be any benefit, um, it's important to be connected. So if you have a go-to benefits advisor, that's terrific. You should have somebody that you can call and talk to them about changes in your employment situation or changes in your Social Security or your other public benefits. If you don't have somebody that you can pick up the phone and talk to, please give us a call. You can call NICE, and my number and my card is over there. Um, you can call us, and we can connect somebody to you. So there are a lot of uh, benefits advisors throughout the state of New York, and it doesn't have to be necessarily face-to-face. -face. It can be a virtual appointment with that person. So if you live in a rural area and you don't have somebody right there for you, we can connect you with somebody. Um, in fact, you can even go to our website, the nice.ny.gov, and we have a locator map on that website. And so you can search for a, an employment provider or you can search for a benefits advisor. And you can find them yourself if you'd like to, or you can give us a call and we can help you with that. Um, the other thing is it's important for you to have a go-to site, like a website, for you to get information about benefits. And so we have our customer resource page listed there. Um, so again, our website, and you can go to customer resources um, to get information about different benefits that you might be eligible for. And there is a public benefit um, assessment. You can put in information to see what other types of public benefits you might be eligible for. Uh, in addition, there is the Choose Work website, which is related to Ticket to Work. Um, and they have a lot of information on their website about benefits as well. So you can check those out. So one of the things that we want to talk about as far as the basics of things is that SSI and SSDI are separate benefit types. And they calculate wages in different ways. But in either case, working is still a good idea. 
So I have a little, uh, it's my little commercial, always consult the benefits advisor, I say that all the time. Um, wages must be reported in all scenarios to reduce the possibility of overpayments. Now overpayments may happen because sometimes when you report your wages, there's a lag in the time period that Social Security actually gets that information and uploads that information. So if there is an overpayment situation, again, working with a benefits advisor can help you navigate that situation. So it may not fully disappear, but they can help you figure out a system with Social Security um, to pay it back or to reduce that amount. If you earn enough for cash benefits to stop, there are still ways to contribute, or I'm sorry, to continue to receive free Medicaid. So there are two um, processes. One is the 1619B, and we'll talk about that, and the Medicaid buying for working people with disabilities. Now those two things are out there for people to utilize, and they're very underutilized. So we want to bring some attention to those so that you can get a feel for um, the availability of something that might be able to help you maintain your health insurance. In addition, if you want to save more money than allowable for resource limits, so you know, Social Security SSI requires a $2,000 resource limit. Um, if you want to save money, there are a couple of ways to do that. One is using an ABLE account, and the next is the plan to achieve self-support or PASS plan. So we'll talk about those two in a little bit as well. Okay, so let's talk about the facts and the myths about employment. So traditionally, it takes a long time to get benefits, right? People have sometimes spent years trying to make sure that they're eligible for it, that Social Security awards the benefit. And so when that happens, sometimes people are anxious about going to work because they're going to lose that benefit. And so it's really important that we have this kind of conversation with people. Um, also, family and friends, they hear stories about disasters, things that happen when someone goes to work and they lose their benefits and they're in all kinds of scary scenarios. And so what we want to do is talk about those as well in those employment conversations that you're having. Um, but, but people don't want to encourage individuals to pursue employment because, again, there's a fear about what will happen if they do. So those are the things that we want to talk about today. So these are some of the common myths, and I'm sure that you've heard them, or maybe you've thought them in the past, um, but I'm required to work under a specific number of hours, and that way I can keep all of my benefits. So that is a myth. Um, I can't work because I'm disabled. People insisting that you are stable before you can go to work, so you're not ready yet, you can't go to work yet, or potentially losing your health care benefits. So these are the myths that we want to talk about today. So the first one is, I can only work 20 hours a week if I want to keep my benefits. And the truth is, there are several variables about keeping your Social Security benefits while you work. And it's not all about the number of hours that you work. There are a lot of different variables in place. So variables can include the benefit type that you're receiving, SSI, SSDI. Uh, the number of hours, the hourly wages that you're earning, and also the work incentives. If you are using any of the work incentives, um, they may assist you in keeping your benefit longer than if you're not using the work incentives. So we want to talk about that. So working only 20 hours a week is not realistic. There are a lot of different variables that affect that. The next one is that I have a disability, so I can't work. And Social Security recognizes that individuals with disabilities can work, and they have created what's called the Ticket to Work program. And they created this program to help people go to work and become self-sufficient, financially self-sufficient, and reduce their reliance on Social Security benefits. If you're eligible for the Ticket to Work program, there's only a couple of criteria. One is that you're receiving SSI and or SSDI benefits, and the other is the age range. You have to be between the ages of 18 and 64. And if those two criteria are met, then you are eligible for the Ticket to Work program if you want to go to work. Um, it is a voluntary program, and you can receive employment services at no cost. 
So it's really a beneficial type program that they've created to help people. Um, sometimes people are afraid to jump on that bandwagon to start the Ticket to Work program, but there are a lot of positive aspects to it, and we'll talk about that toward the end. So another myth is that I can't work until I'm considered stable by my psychiatrist. The myth that individuals must be considered ready or stable and sometimes even compliant before they can go to work is just not true. So supports are available to help a person obtain or maintain employment even while they are managing barriers to employment. Um, mental health symptoms, housing, transportation needs, or even educational needs. So there are supports. So if you're working with an employment provider, um, an employment specialist can help develop what's called natural supports within your employment situation that can be there and ready to help you as you navigate the symptoms, the mental health symptoms or other needs that you have, other barriers to employment. But there are people out in the world who are homeless and still working, and they go to work every day. So it's not, it's not true that you can't work because you're not stable. The next one is that if I go to work, I will lose my health care benefits. And there are ways for you to maintain both Medicaid and Medicare benefits. And as I said before, we have the Medicaid 1619B, the Medicaid buy-in for working people with disabilities, and then we'll talk about Medicare separately. So the 1619B program is a special rule that allows an individual to maintain Medicaid coverage even if their earnings go above or they're too high to maintain an SSI cash benefit. So you could lose your cash benefit from Social Security, but through the Medicaid 1619B program, you can maintain your Medicaid benefits. So if you're eligible for 1619B, it should be an automatic process, but sometimes, you know, it's not. So there is a template letter on our website that you can complete and send it to Social Security, giving them a heads up. Hey, I think um, I'm earning wages, I'm gonna lose my benefit, but I think I'm eligible for this Medicaid 19, uh, 1619B. Um, and so you can send that to them. The eligibility requirements for this program include that you were eligible for SSI benefits just for one month that you would be eligible for SSI cash benefit except your earnings are too high. You are still disabled and you still meet all of the other eligibility rules, including the resources test. You do need Medicaid in order to go to work, maintain your job, and you have gross earned income that is insufficient to replace SSI or Medicaid. So you may have increased income, which is terrific, but it's not enough maybe to buy into your employer's insurance plan. It doesn't cover what you need it to cover. So 1619B might be one of those alternatives for you. We also have the Medicaid buy-in for working people with disabilities. Um, and if you attended the opening ceremonies this morning, you heard that Governor Hochul uh, increased the limits for the Medicaid buy-in program. And that's terrific news. Um, so the Medicaid buy-in program offers Medicaid coverage to people with disabilities who are working and earning more than the allowable limits for regular Medicaid, and it's free. So you can have a gross income as high as $73,932 for an individual and still maintain your Medicaid coverage. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is one of those underutilized programs. So if you feel like you might be eligible for that, absolutely check in with a benefits advisor in order to get more information about how to do this. Um, also, they do have a resource limit for the Medicaid buy-in program, but for a single individual um, in a one-person household, it's 30,182. So that's a, that's a lot in resources and still be able to maintain your Medicaid. There is also um, MBI toolkit and there's the link for that toolkit. Now I'm not sure that it's updated with the newest numbers for the uh, gross income and the resources limit, but it does give you some basic information 
about the Medicaid buy-in for people, for working people with disabilities. So when we talk about health care, we also have to consider Medicare benefits. So individuals who are working and receiving SSDI benefits, they may also be eligible for Medicare coverage. So following the trial work period, and we'll talk about SSDI in a little bit, but following the trial work period, individuals can still continue to receive at least 93 months of Medicare coverage, and that's seven years and nine months. That's a long time. Um, hospital insurance part A, they can have premium free. If you are already enrolled in the supplemental medical insurance part B, that would be included as well. And if you're also already enrolled in the prescription drug coverage part D, you also could include that. So if you have part A, B, and D um, after the trial work period, you can still get that coverage for free. After the premium free Medicare coverage ends due to work, you can buy continued Medicare coverage as long as you remain disabled. So there are ways to be able to maintain your Medicaid and your Medicare benefits. Okay, so we have a little bit of information on SSI and SSDI benefits. So the SSI program provides a cash benefit to people who have low income and low resources. The resource limits in 2023 for a single individual is $2,000. If you have a spouse, it's $3,000. And those figures may change year to year, but in 2023, that's what they are. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that SSI uses what's called an SSI calculation sheet to determine your eligibility for the benefit amount, the cash benefit payment that you would get. So there are calculation sheets, uh, and you can find one on our website under the Customer Resources tab, to actually calculate your benefit amount um, based on that information. There are some work incentives that are specific to SSI that we want to talk about, um, and there are others, but these are the most uh, prevalent. So again, if you speak with a benefits advisor, they can give you much more detail on other benefits that might be uh, helpful for you. So the first is the student earned income, and then the impairment related work expense, and the blind work expense. So the student earned income exclusion allows a person who is under the age of 22 and they're regularly attending school. So it can be part-time or full-time, doesn't matter, just regularly attending school. And they're working, again, either part-time or full-time, um, to exclude some of their earnings from their income when SSA calculates their SSI cash benefit. So if an individual, my example is a person who is 19, and they are going to school part-time and they're working part-time and maybe they earn two thousand dollars this month they can use the student earned income exclusion to exclude that two thousand dollars this month next month if they also earn two thousand dollars and they're using the exclusion they can use that same two thousand dollar exclusion there is a maximum limit of eight thousand nine hundred and fifty per year but um, again, these totals might change year to year. So that is for 2023. <clears throat> the impairment related work expense is also called an IRWI. Um, IRWIs are costs for items or services that you need in order to go to work. Um, and they have to be related to your disability and the costs are not being reimbursed by anybody else. Social Security will deduct the cost of an IRWI from your countable income when they determine your eligibility for the Social Security Disability Benefits. So the IRWI, as an example, might be a co-payment. So if you have to go to the doctor because of your disability, <clears throat> excuse me, have to go to the doctor because of your disability and you have a $25 co-payment, you may be able to use that $25 copayment that's not being reimbursed by anybody else as part of an IRWI. 
You can use medications, co-payments, other kinds of expenses that you need in order to go to work related to your disability. We also have the blind work expense. And this is very similar to the IRWI with a couple of exceptions. So the blind work expense is, uh, includes both costs for items and services that you need in order to work, so that's the same. Um, and the costs are not being reimbursed by anybody else, and that's the same as the IRWI. The difference is that the blind work expense does not have to be related to your disability. It can be any expense that you have because you have to go to work. So the costs do have to be reasonable costs according to the SSA definition. <clears throat> so there are specific guidelines on reason, what reasonable means according to Social Security. So now we're going to turn to SSDI benefits and talk a little bit about that. Um, SSA provides cash benefits to individuals who have worked and paid into the insurance program and the amount that you receive is based on your earnings, your previous earnings. Um, there are several work incentives that are available for individuals who receive SSDI and again there are others but we're only going to cover these today. Uh, the trial work period, the extended period of eligibility, and the expedited reinstatement. Uh, I think there was something else I wanted to say here. Um, the information, so as you work, you're building up credits to go to work. And if you earn enough credits, which a typical adult would require 40 work credits, in order to be eligible for SSDI benefits. Um, and again, a benefits advisor is a good idea because there are exceptions to that rule that you, if you wanted to check that out, that would be a good idea to check with a benefits advisor to check that out. Um, okay, and so on to the, the work incentive. So we want to talk about the trial work period first. So the trial work period allows you to test your ability to work um, at least nine months without losing your SSDI benefits. You will receive the full SSDI cash benefit regardless of how high your earnings might be as long as you report your work activity, so your wages, and you continue to have disability, disabling impairment. So the trial work period, so let's talk about that for just a second. Um, it's nine months in time, but it doesn't have to be consecutive months. So the trial work period begins when you earn over 1050 per month. That's the trial work level, and that's in 2023. But let's say in this month, October, we earn $1,050 per month. But next month, we earn $900. And then the following month, we're back over $1,050. So in that three-month period, we've only used two trial work period months because they're not, they don't have to be consecutive, and that just is a nine-month period. Once the trial work period is over, we automatically go into what's called the extended period of eligibility. And this is a 36 month period in which you receive your cash benefit for all months that your earnings are below what's called SGA, that stands for substantial gainful activity. And that's a figure that Social Security has come up with uh, as the marker for um, being successful. If you continue to have a disabling impairment, you also then would continue to receive the benefit. Um, but let's talk about that for just a minute. So if after the trial work period ends and the next month you earn over SGA level, which is 1470 in 2023, um, then what happens is the process of terminating your benefits because you've reached over that 1470 per month. Um, and then there is a termination, or it's called the cessation month, and then two months that are grace period. But during that 36 period month period, if you fall below that SGA level, you can get your SSDI benefits back uh, reasonably quickly from Social Security. So that is a huge benefit for people who are trying to work and making it work sometimes, but not always being able to manage over that SGA level. Once that 36 month period has uh, expired, and let's say that you have worked and you've reached that SGA level um, and your 
benefits have been terminated. You're no longer receiving your SSDI benefits. What happens then is you're working, everything is going well, and then there is a problem. Something happens and you lose your job, um, you fall way below that SGA level again, there's something called an expedited reinstatement. And what happens during this time is that your cash benefits end because you're increased wages. Within that five years, your earnings fall below SGA level, you may be able to have your benefits reinstated. And what happens then is you would call Social Security, talking to your benefits advisor first, of course, um, call Social Security um, and talk with them about expedited reinstatement, asking them to reinstate your benefit. They have six months to determine whether or not you will get your benefit back, your cash benefit back. But during that time, they will give you your benefit. You can request that they give you your benefit while they're doing this review period. Um, then at the end of that review period, if they say yes, you can have your benefit back, then things will just continue as normal. You'll get your SSDI benefit back. And in the future, um, you will get a new trial work period and a new exp um, extended period of eligibility. All those things will kick in again, but it will be a period of time before that happens. If they say no, we're not going to reinstate that benefit. You do not have to pay back that SSDI benefit that they gave you during that six month review, which is a huge benefit for people. Um, the other part of that is then you can reapply for SSDI benefits. So sometimes what happens is when you've been initially given the benefit, um, over time your disability changes. So you may not have that disabling condition anymore, but maybe there's symptoms that are related to some other disability, and now you don't qualify under your original disability, but if you reapply for services, you may qualify for disability benefits under a new diagnosis. Um, so that's part of the expedited reinstatement process. Okay, and the, the last section Today, we want to talk about ABLE accounts and past plans. So an ABLE account is a savings program for eligible people with disabilities who have resources that would otherwise make them ineligible for other benefits. So for example, if you receive $10,000 in an inheritance and you put it in your savings account, you've already gone over your resource limit for SSI benefits and you will lose your SSI cash benefit. But if you open an ABLE account and you put that money in an ABLE account, they don't count, Social Security does not count the ABLE account as a resource. And so you can still use your money in the ABLE account for all the things that you would normally use it for. Um, it can be used to maintain your health, your independence, and your quality of life. So it's a great program. Again, it's one of those underutilized services that uh, we hope to get the word out so people can use this. But it's a great benefit for people. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, I saw in the concourse, um, New York ABLE. So if you're not familiar with them, uh, they are the organization that maintains the ABLE account uh, for people in New York State. And I would recommend that you check them out. It's called NY ABLE. Okay, and then the last thing we wanna talk about is the plan to achieve self-support or a pass plan. So the pass plan allows you to set aside money other than your SSI benefit check uh, for a specific time period so that you can go to work, achieve your work goals without losing your SSI cash benefit. So this would be an example if you wanted to, let's say you needed to get a car in order to go to work. <clears throat> So you would develop this plan, excuse me. <clears throat> Talking too much today. <clears throat> so you would develop this plan with, you can do it with a benefits advisor. It has to be an approved plan through Social Security. So you can say, I wanna put aside $50 a month into a pass plan, and in two years, I'm gonna buy a car or maybe it'll be $100, depending on what car you're gonna get. Um, but anyway, you're gonna put so much money in an account to save for that vehicle that you want and that you need in order to get you to work. 
So again, it has to be approved by Social Security. Um, but once you have that and the time limit runs out and you have your, your money in that account, you have to use it for that purpose. So it's not something that you can say, well, now I don't need a car, I wanna do this instead. Um, it all has to be approved from Social Security though. So you would run that by them. Sometimes the time limit can be extended, but again, it has to be approved through Social Security to do that. Okay, this last part is about Ticket to Work. So I don't know if you know anybody's involved or interested in Ticket to Work, but I wanted to at least let you know about this uh, benefit that Social Security has created. So Ticket to Work is an employment program through Social Security, and it can work in collaboration with your current supports. So if you're already working with somebody to help you find a job, uh, if they're a part of the Ticket to Work program, they can be included in this process. Uh, through, it's a voluntary program, so individuals can start the program and stop the program at any time. There's no uh, you know, force for you to stay in it. Uh, if you get Social Security benefits and you're between the ages of 18 and 64, Social Security will send you a letter in the mail that says, hey, you might be eligible for the ticket program. Are you interested? And then they oftentimes in that letter send you a list of potential providers that you can connect with for the Ticket to Work program. And if you assign your ticket to an employment provider, Social Security will suspend what they call the continuing disability review. But the caveat is that you have to be making timely progress. So the continuing disability review is that medical review that you get every three to five years, depending on your specific situation. Um, what they will say is if you're in the Ticket to Work program, you don't have to do that continuing disability review, but you have to make timely progress. And according to Social Security, timely progress means that you are going on job interviews, that you're getting a job, that you're cooperating with your employment provider. Maybe you're going to school and reaching certain um, credentials at school. <clears throat> and once that happens, <coughs> The employment provider that you're working with can assist you in uh, looking for jobs and obtaining a job and maintaining that job. So the ticket program is extensively throughout all phases of the employment process. In addition, you can talk with a benefits advisor through the ticket program and benefits advisors um, are available to help you understand how working will impact those benefits. And I, I really feel like anybody, regardless of benefit type, should be connected to a benefits advisor. And this is the end of our presentation. So again, I work for NICE, the New York Employment Services System. And this is my contact information. If you'd like to reach out, please feel free to do so. And it looks like we have a few minutes for questions. Yes. Yes, so there are a couple of places that you can get certified benefits advisors. So Cornell University is one program and Virginia Commonwealth University is the other program that I'm familiar with. If you have a person who has gone through either of those programs, they should be certified. Wait, but where would there be like a list of those? Yes, okay. on our website, on that locator map, uh, we have developed what's called WIN, Work Incentive Network, and they are only certified benefits advisors on that network. In addition, I want to point out, and I should have added a list here of resources, but um, in addition, are you familiar with the Department of Labor? Okay, the Department of Labor, they have workforce development boards, and they have hired what's called DRCs, Disability Resource Coordinators. Those individuals are either currently certified or are in the process of being certified. And so they, and there are 27 throughout the state, 27 
and they represent over 40 counties. So um, they are available as well. And so you can find them. Most of them are on our WIND directory. But if they're not there, you can contact the local office and find out where the DRCs are located, if they're located near you, um, and connect that way. Yeah, and it's important to stick with a person who is certified. And what that means is they have to have certain credentials and be recertified every five years. Yes. And that was Kathy. She is a DRC. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's a lot of DRCs here. Would everybody like to raise their hand who's a DRC? And maybe we can, and maybe we can reconnect. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a few. So... If you want to connect with a DRC before you leave, that's who you call. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes. Quick question. If someone were to come in and they're on SSI and they have $100, you get the BBQI, you see it and you realize that they have an overpayment that they reasonably request to keep $10 a month. So they get an but their rent is 100 right? If you get them back to work, what happens to that overpayment? Is it reasonably requested to stay with $10? Does it pay off? And they get their work exemption? Yeah, I think if it's an agreement between Social Security and the customer, it stays at what that agreement price is. If that person is earning more money and they say, oh, now I can pay $15, that could be up to them. They could renegotiate that amount with Social Security if they wanted to. But uh, my opinion is that it would stay at that $10 because it was an agreement with Social Security regardless of the income. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm actually certified as a self employment specialist in the Virginia Commonwealth University, but one of the things that I was so happy to see this and to see past my ticket to work, I focus on self employment on entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Sure. And um, my colleague here from Albany Law School, um, we have a program here um, that we did a soft launch of in working with women entrepreneurs leading into women with a disability or chronic illness, but we've been working with anyone who would come. I specialize in working with past clients. And with past, thank you for having it here, but I tell people, I've worked with people over the country. I've gotten, I've done hundreds of past clients over the years. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Yeah, and you know, you bring up a really good point. Uh, the self-employed, they also can get benefits, SSI, SSDI benefits, and there's not a lot of information out there about what happens when someone is self-employed and getting benefits, and that would be a great addition to this training or a separate document on how that works for individuals. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I think that's terrific. Kathy, did you want to add something? Yep. Yeah, great. Great information. So please utilize the PASS plan and the ABLE accounts. They're a really important process. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Oh, great. And that's great feedback for them. Yep. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.